After recording this session, Surviving the Aftermath, the New York Times published a piece entitled Sundance Liked Her Documentary on Terrorism Until Muslim Critics Didn't by Michael Powell. This piece deeply concerns IDA. It minimizes the importance of Muslim filmmakers who organized against the platforming of a film, Jihad Rehab, also known as The Unredacted, which perpetuates war on terror rhetoric. It falsely asserts that the Muslim filmmakers are only concerned about the racial identity of the film's makers, and it avoids meaningful discussion of the film's ethical lapse of care for the people it records. These are examples of the very topic this panel addresses, quote, the negative repercussions of criticizing and demanding change from powerful gatekeeping institutions in the documentary field, end quote. Okay. Welcome everyone to Surviving the Aftermath. This panel is part of Getting Real 2022, and I'm so excited to introduce Sami Khan, Jude Shahab, and Rosie Jaffrey, the, our panelists today. Um, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Leila Muchnik Benali. I use she and they pronouns. I work at the, at the Wexner Center for the Arts in Columbus, Ohio. So that's where I'm tuning in from. And the goal of this conversation is to take up some questions of representation as they apply to Muslim and Middle Eastern, North African and South Asian communities, institutional accountability, and what it takes to persist in the documentary field as Mina Sum makers. So I'm super excited to introduce our panelists, just as a reminder for everyone to say your name before you speak. But um, first we have Jude Shahab. Jude Shahab is an award-winning DP and feature filmmaker based between New York and Beirut. She's drawn to the esoteric, the spiritual, and the unspoken, and is currently in production on her first feature documentary based in Lebanon, which has been supported by IDA, ITVS, TFI, Sundance, and recently was awarded first prize in the Docs in Progress program at the Thessaloniki Documentary Film Festival. So excited to meet you, Jude. Um, Rosie Jaffrey, next, um, is a documentary photographer and a filmmaker who focuses on religion, culture, politics, and the changing American cultural landscape. In his current role as photographer and project manager at the Center for Arab American Studies, he's working on a collaborative multimedia project titled Halal Metropolis that centers on Muslim visibility in Southeast Michigan. Razi's 2020 film, Hamtramck USA, examines the benefits and tensions of multiculturalism and diversity through the lens of Hamtramck's 2017 municipal elections. And now also excited to introduce Sammy Khan, who is a Canadian filmmaker whose films include St. Louis Superman, a short documentary that was shortlisted for the 2020 Academy Awards and was acquired by MTV Documentary Films. His 2015 film, Hoya, it's his first fi fiction feature as a writer-director and was selected for the Tribeca Film Institute's All Access Grant. Khan has also worked on the Canadian television series Transplant and most recently directed The Last Out alongside Michael Gassert. So I'm so excited to be here today with the three of you. I really admire all of your work. I've been following sort of the aftermath, you know, the title of this panel being Surviving the Aftermath. and. I feel like that could refer to a lot of different aftermaths, but I know we're specifically thinking about, you know, the aftermath of um, trying to hold an institution like Sundance accountable for programming a film, Jihad Rehab. I know that in March of this year, you all three signed an open letter published in IndieWire that was addressed to Sundance in response to their programming of that film. So I just wanted to check in, like, can you talk about what the response has been from Sundance, from other Muslim makers, or how you're reflecting on this aftermath now? Um, maybe, Sammy, do you want to start us off? Sure. Yeah. First off, for some reason, the fire alarm in our building <laughs> just started <laughs> in an inopportune moment. So I apologize if it starts okay. up right now. It's it stopped. But uh, thanks so much for, for having us, Leila. Thanks to, to Getting Real for programming this panel, um, to Abby Sun for making it happen, and all the people behind the scenes who, uh, um, you know, who facilitated this. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Sammy. I'm uh, you know, I, I uh, in terms of the response, I think one of the surprising things is how much an impact our speaking out had 
at that time, how much it resonated through the industry. Um, and for me personally, I'm a little surprised at uh, how it's kind of petered off. Um, and uh, so there's the fire alarm going on here now. But, uh, but yeah, so I think for us, it's like, what's, what's next? How do we as individual filmmakers, friends, supportive of each other, um, how do we, you know, write the next chapter um, and take that activism and that criticism that came out of um, Sundance 2022 and turn it into actionable change? Yeah, no, that's that's such like the hardest part of organizing. I feel like it's almost like once you identify an issue and you see, oh, this is harmful, this was a problem, let's unpack why. And then moving forward, moving on from that is is sort of a tricky part. I'm curious to hear from Razi or Jude how you all think about that. Yeah, I, I have like uh, kind of mixed feelings about how things were, you know, ended up going. And I, I should mention, yeah, this is Razi uh, speaking. Um, and uh, I have mixed feelings about how, you know, things ended up working out and the, the whole situation is still sort of un, unresolved in many ways. But I think that there were different different types of responses. Um, there was an industry response. There was a Sundance Film Festival response, um, which was, you know, quite lukewarm, I think, at, at best. Um, you know, it really felt like there wasn't a lot of empathy to, um, you know, what the issues that we were raising up and some of the responses felt rather uh, manicured and um, engineered when the Sundance was making public statements. But I think my sense is that the, it had a deep impact. And obviously with people, you know, resigning and leaving the organization, that was a pretty big deal. And I think Sundance will be sort of discussing this for a long time. Um, uh, then there was impact and kind of discussion within the industry. I know that there were um, panels being organized and uh, there were also um, within production companies and broadcasters, uh, all hands meetings or departmental meetings within their documentary groups discussing what was going on. Um, and so I think, you know, going back to Sammy's point where the impact was actually quite far reaching, um, whenever we would discuss, you know, teams that I'm working on projects with, whenever we would discuss um, pitches for our projects, inevitably Jihad Rehab would come up. Um, and sometimes people knew that I was involved in it, sometimes they didn't. Um, but but the, the topic would come up and just out of curiosity, I would ask them. And there were many organizations that were uh, addressing it within their uh, groups, within their organizations. Um, you know, and then there's kind of this other part of it too, which, you know, I think a lot of us took on a great deal of risk with um, speaking up, you know, against the film and raising awareness about it. Um, I personally was part of the Sundance um, uh, documentary producing lab and fellowship, um, which just recently came to an end. So there was a big overlap between that fellowship and what was going on with the activism. And so here I find myself in a situation um, criticizing an organization and criticizing the selection and inclusion of this film by the same organization that's giving me this platform and an amazing opportunity. And of course, you know, we recognize that the Institute is separate from the festival and they work together, but it's different crew and different people. But it was certainly kind of a bizarre uh, experience, you know, at that time. I can go into that a little bit more, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Jude, but just wanted to share some, some thoughts. Yeah, um, this is Jude. Um, I think initially it, the feeling that I had um, was a feeling of hurt. And, and I think I came into it kind of naive. Um, you know, you do put Sundance at this pedestal. I'm working on my first feature. It's always been, you know, that's the deadline that you work towards. Um, and you hear of how powerful of a festival it is. Um, and so I think it also that image kind of came crashing down. Um, and that hurt turned into this boost of energy that I think we all had for months of like, this is, you know, Razi was telling us earlier, like he, he was doing his master's at the time. Like we all kind of put things on hold or this just became like a full-time um, job and uh, responsibility. Um, at the end of the day, like, you know, when you think about Muslims and um, feeling like 
you know, there's this force kind of that is against us and Islamophobia is worldwide um, when it's something that's happening in the arts, which is our field. You know, it only makes sense for us to speak out about it um, and to make things right. And um, I think in a lot of ways, the impact um, was strong and it started a lot of conversations. I think, um, I don't know, and maybe this is me just, I don't know, being jaded or something, but um, it, it all really comes down to action and where do we go um, from here? Personally, it's made me, right, right now we're editing and <laughs> gonna submit to Sundance in <laughs> like two weeks, but um, it's made me wanna be a more bold Muslim storyteller. Like it's made me kind of, you know, I think you, um, you uh, go into the work kind of easy at a certain point and you feel like institutions are also telling you to water things down and um, just seeing everything that happened and really a need for Muslim stories and people were asking for it as well. So it makes you wanna come and bring something that's so genuine uh, and honest. And so I think it really is just about like, you know, this thing happened, you know, how do we go from here? Um, and that's with everything. Like, I don't know. I, I even think a lot about how, like, the, even saying the Middle East, you know, that's something that we say now is problematic. And, um, um, you know, white people gave us that title for our region. Um, but it's like, I don't know. I've always thought that we get so, like, caught up in the words and the language. And it's like, but our people are being killed. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't, what's the action? Okay, we, we did all of this. And, and now what's to come? Yeah, that's really true. I feel like the arts are a great space to have conversations and to come to understanding. And then when it comes to inciting change, I wonder, there's sort of a difference in those processes, but a connection at the same time. Um, yeah, thank you all for sharing those really thoughtful responses and thinking about the aftermath of that time. There was just, I mean, I know just from my perspective, it was just like, I felt a lot of admiration for the work that you all were doing really publicly to, to sort of hold a huge gatekeeping institution accountable. Um, I guess I have a question kind of about that idea of representation. The description in this panel talks about the weight of representation. So I'm curious to think, what are your frameworks for thinking about representation in your own work? It's a big word. It's a word that's used by a lot of people to mean a lot of different things. So. I don't know if um, maybe Razi, you want to start us off thinking about representation, what that means to you. Oh, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. No yeah, it's it's a very big topic, and thank you for asking the question. Um, uh, I actually just as a bit of background, um, I used to be an engineer, uh, which is what I studied as a good South Asian Muslim <laughs> young man. <laughs> Um, growing up in America to fulfill cultural expectations. Um, and uh, so I switched careers to become a filmmaker and a storyteller. All right, so um, welcome back everyone. Just to give a little context, um, we had to stop recording yesterday due to some technical difficulties, but we're back and better than ever. It's Friday morning and I'm really excited to pick up the conversation where we left off. Um, I know we were talking about representation. Um, oh, this is Layla, by the way. Um, and I know before everything started to freeze up, Razi, you were talking about um, the responsibility to get it right. So I didn't know if you wanted to revisit that thought, complete that thought, or if Sammy or Jude, you wanted to add anything into that as well. Yeah, I can just sort of finish the thought and, and pass it on. I, I just, I, I think I was concluding with the point that um, it's a it's a really big responsibility, you know, that we're taking on. Um, but uh, it, you know, those those stories that are told from the perspective of members of the community are going to be the ones that are the most authentic. And um, when we have people that tell stories that are not from those communities, we're going to find ourselves disappointed um, in the results. And so we have to become part of the discourse. And that's certainly one of the main reasons why I wanted to get into filmmaking uh, in general. If I could just chime in too, Leila, I, because um, I think this is, might have been off camera we're talking about this. You know, one of the things that was really uh, surprising and disappointing about it 
was how ahistorical the discussion was and, and just the, the conversation around the representation of Muslims and Arabs and people from the region. Um, so I think it's important to locate us historically. We live at a moment of remarkable Islamophobia, certainly the, the highest moment of anti-Muslim bias in my lifetime. And that includes the period after 9-11 um, which I was in college at the time, you know, you have, you know, a Hindu supremacist government in India, you know, where my father's from, you have, you know, disputed reports, credible reports, whatever you want to call them of the treatment of the Uyghurs in China. And then you have decades and decades going before 9-11, predating 9-11, the U.S. government's interventions in the Middle East that, you know, again, go back decades and decades. So on the one hand, you have these governments pursuing deliberate anti-Muslim policies, some of which uh, are tantamount to genocide. And then you have this whole Islamophobia industry um, supported by people like the Mercer family who've poured hundreds of millions of dollars into demonizing Muslims, which, you know, tap into the Fox News ecosystem, but also this sort of center, center left, you know, neoconservative, neoliberal, uh, you know, way of thinking about the Muslim world, which is circles back to, you know, the, uh, the Edward Said quote about representation of the East, quote unquote, of the Orient, you know, and this is, Edward Said, this book was written over 40 years ago. He's been dead for, you know, however long, 15 years. It was really, you know, kind of dispiriting how in this controversy, so few people seem to have uh, read Said or understood him. But Said articulately, brilliantly said that one of the central tenets in the way the West represents the East is the Western expert right? Like the Western expert is like the unbiased one, right? And there's centuries of stories about kind of charlatans who would go to the East and, you know, discover the, you know, the mysteries of the Orient and have the solutions to, you know, these intractable conflicts. And then they're celebrated in wherever the National Geographic Society or this and that film festival. Um, and, I think it's really important to sort of circle back and locate us to, you know, where we are in terms of 21st century history, but then also those centuries of Orientalism and how, you know, what we bring to it just by nature of our experience and the dis discussions we have, our, our lived experience, but then also just academics, right? Just history. This is what happened. This is where we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go for it, Jude. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, just so many things um, to think about what you're saying, Sammy. And I think um, that it wasn't a matter of, and I, this is what I think a lot of people misunderstood of Meg being white. Um, like Sammy said, it was this viewpoint. Um, it's all about intention. You know, you can't separate the artist's intention from the art. Um, and it was very clear what her intention was. And she, you know, said it clearly of like trying to go into the region and, you know, um, humanize us um, from her perspective. It was it was very much um, those were the ethics behind it. And and all of this, um, the way that we are perceived, it affects us as Muslim filmmakers, because like even the reason I got into film is you go in, I need to break these stereotypes. I need to change the narrative. Um, and then you get like the last 20 years or so of Muslims in, in film that the work that they're doing is mostly to prove, you know, I'm not a terrorist and it comes from a place of fear. And so this place of fear, I feel like even goes into um, our films nowadays um, where now it's all about assimilation and um, making work that's saying, you know, oh, I'm just like you. Um, we have the same values. You know, I skateboard just like you do. Um, and so it really it makes the films ingenuine in a way. Um, and so I think like when I think about representation, it, for me, it really is about like stripping all of that 
and what does it what does our true Muslim voice sound like um, when it's unfiltered um, when we're not coming from this place of um, yeah even assimilation or you know the films that you see from the region we we play into basically I'm trying to say is like the same sometimes stereotypes because we know that those films are going to work and so it really affects on on so many different levels not only when someone from outside the community is making a film about us but also it affects now when films come out of the region as well yeah i love all this you guys are really hitting like so many different intersecting and interesting um facets of representation because there's history there's decades of history. Um, Jude, I loved what you said about stripping away, that kind of act of stripping away everything. And I wonder if you might be willing to share about how you've adapted your making process or your filmmaking process with that kind of stripping away in mind. I know you're right now in post-production wrapping up a film, so I wonder if you want to talk about that. Yeah. Um, yeah I think it's like that act of stripping away is like making something that's not reactionary. You're not like trying to confront something else. You're just making something in its genuine form. Um, and I think that after everything that happened, like these last six months, and maybe I said it yesterday as well, of just trying to be bolder. I think, you know, um, maybe in the beginning, you also kind of play into that. But just everything that happened really helped me understand uh, my voice. I think, you know, what happened was so powerful. Like I barely knew any of these filmmakers on a personal level before we organized. Um, and it was just so amazing to share like the same energy, same values, ethics. Um, so I think it really validated a lot of my intentions. And, you know, when we're in the edit room right now, you hear a lot of the feedback and it's always in the back of my mind. Oh, what did this institution tell me? What did this fellowship tell me? We don't understand this. We don't understand that. Where are we? Like literally put a title card, say Beirut, Lebanon. And it's like, this is, it's not um, integral to the story, it really isn't. And it's not something that you need to know. Um, and so it's like all of these things to make the film digestible, to also give you this, this ending that they expected um, in, in the spirit of like getting real. <laughs> I literally, I had a funder um, basically, like I didn't get the fund because the film doesn't have this secular ending. They say like your mom isn't, does, is not, like lib liberated by the end of the film. She doesn't rip her hijab off and like, you know, rooftop dancing around, like she leaves the cult and it's not like that. And it's, it was just so crazy to hear it because this is the kind of stuff that you speculate about. Um, and it's so hard because once you hear stuff like that, you're just like, they literally said like, it wouldn't work in this era and this time, like, you know, for someone to like, just be Muslim. And so it's so um, difficult. It's very challenging and, but it's, allowed me to like it's not an easy thing to do but just trying to hold on to that and remember why i'm making it wow i can't i mean i can believe but also yeah just want to validate that your film doesn't have to be like digestible to a western audience you know um and i think it's impressive that you and important that you stick to like what is meaningful for you um sammy or razi i don't know if you have any other like stories or or examples of how um the your organizing in response to the programming of jihad we have might have influenced maybe or changed the way that you approach making um and making your films or your work or image making in general well i think you know some of the impact of the organizing on the industry and how um, films are made and stories are told about the Muslim community or the Manasa region are yet to be determined. Uh, I think, you know, this is all in such recent history. We're talking just the last few months. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I, I think, you know, Sammy brought up this point about there were all these sort of um, left turns that we'd have to start un unpacking to course correct because a lot of people were presuming that our frustration and our advocacy against the film was because Meg is white and, and isn't Muslim, and that had very little to do with it. And so, uh, you know, we live in a world where anybody can make a film about any topic, but there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And there are films about um, either national security or Muslim 
storylines that were done by non-Muslim filmmakers that were done fairly well. And there are some that are, and then, and then there's a the lot of them which are done quite, quite badly, you know? So I, 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 I think that's yet to be determined. I just hope that the industry is listening and paying attention and, um, and yeah, I think, you know, we, we need to figure out, uh, a, a, a way to do this right. And, you know, we all work in topics that are about communities or individuals that we're not directly related to, you know, even for me, a lot of my work is in the Muslim community, but um, I'm often working with communities that I don't have a connection to, whether it's African American Muslims or, um, you know, where I live, there's a small uh, Eastern European Muslim community from the Balkan region. And I've done a lot of photography and documentary film work in that community. And I'm a total outsider. I, I don't uh, fit in. I am not, you, you know, my, my Muslimness only gets me so far <laughs> in those communities. And so I have to bring a degree of sensitivity and understanding um, and, uh, and, and have a lot of communication with these communities before I, begin, I bring the camera into the room. So I think that applies to us as well. But um, certainly when it comes to the Muslim community, there's been such a bastardization of the, of how Muslims are portrayed. And so I, I just, I hope that the industry is listening and paying attention and paying attention to our names and who we are. And, and so if there are films that are being produced about Muslims or the regions where some of us come from that will be consulted um, in a sincere way, um, you know, about those projects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I like that you brought in this theme of community and um, because that is one of the themes of getting real this year is shifting away from like the individual genius model and thinking more commun like in a communal collaborative or collective way, I guess. Um, I wonder if Jude or Sammy, you have any thoughts about the role of the collective or the communal in, in your work, in your practice um, as maybe different than collaboration even, I don't know. Not sure what you all think yeah i mean i was actually thinking that too as rosie was talking like one of the um real leaps in you know this year to say this like the last 12 months is the community of manasa filmmakers you know and in this case particularly muslims uh, Muslim filmmakers of various races um, and backgrounds and ethnicities um, and genders came together to to build a community um, and didn't wait for one the, like liberal establishment to validate, but also uh, didn't rely on sort of Muslim establishment those organizations and. I say this with love because, you know, I have friendships and relationships with some of the people there. Uh, but I think it was like a learning experience for them too. Um, some of these bigger Muslim American lobbying groups where um, they discovered that the, you know, idea of access uh, to the system, to the, you know, powers that be is in, is often in conflict with that notion of community. And it was through, you know, discussions amongst ourselves, uh, Rezi, Jude, you know, the dozen or more other filmmakers where we really fostered the sense of community in solidarity, you know, which was really impressive where it's like, I may not agree with your tactic right now, but we're in this together. And if we're gonna make change, if we're gonna have momentum, then we have to understand each other's point of view and work together and find consensus where we can and and push on. Um, but I do think that that was like, aside from my filmmaking work, which I don't really think is informed by it. I mean, certainly there's more urgency with it, but I always like kind of operate with an urgency. It, it is that sense of, of community uh, and, the realization that uh, 
nobody else is going to do it <laughs> basically. So we'll have to do it ourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was a wake up call for us, but I think it was also a wake up call for some of these institutions. Yeah, absolutely. Jude, I didn't, I couldn't tell if you had a thought or something to add to that. It's okay if you don't. You know, everything Sammy said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, love I, that. I will just add that I feel like I had been in, it was so organic the way that it happened and it just felt so pure and right um, in a way that maybe sometimes like other groups or fellowships, like it, you know, you can claim that like, oh, we're all one big community. We're all this, but like it, it, it might never feel that way. Um, and this, the way that it just came out was just so, um, yeah, just natural. And we all, um, really believed in one thing, although, yeah, like Sammy said, like we, we, we come from different backgrounds as well. It's not like we have the same, you know, we think all the same way, but, um, yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. And it also sounds like there was just like, a sense of trust that was really fostered, perhaps like among all of you all like right away. Um, and I feel like trust is one of is is often an element I feel is like missing from a lot of the conversations around um, organizing. I feel like you can only organize with people you trust. Right. Um, and I guess I wonder, yeah, like what role does trust play in your making practices or maybe to broaden that question, like knowing that process of like making can be political and can be kind of a way to embody like the ethics or the like worldview that you want to bring into the world. How do you approach um, literally like the nuts and bolts of shooting, editing, uh, producing work? Um, maybe, yeah, Rosie. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a really good question. And I think, you know, with documentaries, you're dealing with, you know, obviously real people in their lives and um, all of their vulnerabilities that, you know, they're sharing with you. And so it takes an incredible amount of trust, um, you know, both with the subjects, but uh, also with the team. But, you know, in terms of this with the subjects, so, so much of it, you know, for for me is just doing what you say you're going to do. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the ways that trust is very quickly eroded um, if you don't end up doing what you say you're going to do. And obviously, things change very rapidly when, you know, we're working on these projects. Um, but that communication is really, really important. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, you know, try to... Um, you know, impress that on everybody that I'm working with, you know, just to try to communicate as clearly as possible, knowing full well that things are going to change. But that's especially um, true when it comes to the subjects or the protagonists that I'm working with, um, is to show up when we say we're going to show up and to do what we say we're going to do. Um, and uh, I think that's kind of a simple way to put it, but that's, you know, one of the big um, takeaways that I've had, <laughs> you know, from this experience. So, yeah, I think for me, um, the film I'm working on is a personal film. So it's like building trust with <laughs> my parents. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's always just been about like, um, doing justice to the story. Um, and there's times where maybe the participants themselves can't see the bigger picture. Um, but it's, always been about being transparent with them. Um, I got a lot of advice to like, not show my mother footage until the end, just show her like the cut at the end. And I was like, no, like I was showing her things from the beginning. It was also, it's a heavy subject matter. Um, if she had seen the scenes at the end of it, they would have probably really shook her. And, and uh, because she had become so um, comfortable with the scenes. And, and I mean, it's, there's like scenes where they're fighting and arguing and it's, it's, very intimate. Um, but I think just carrying that transparency throughout and, and knowing my intentions, because I, all human action goes back to like your ethics and your intention. Um, yeah. That's so true. I don't know, Sammy, if you have any thoughts also. Yeah. I mean, it, it uh, you know, I also think like trust was, 
earned and it's like continually earned and it was like it, it not to be too like kumbaya about it it was like it's like oh who is this person i don't know this person it's like okay you have to vouch for this person um mm -hmm. and uh you know these discussions are discreet and uh because i think again to sort of locate us too one of the dumbest parts of the culture today and like certainly of this whole saga is this the idiocy of cancel culture right and so it's like for anyone to claim your film is like platformed at the most prominent film festival in the world and gets rave reviews from the all of the virtually all of the trade press um and you're making a film which in effect is like kind of canceling these men, right? It's like saying, labeling them in a certain way, boxing them in to a certain way. So your film is like platform. You have exercised your free speech rights to make this film. These men are being impacted. Um, but then also we're just exercising our free speech rights to criticize a film we see as problematic. And let's be honest about the actual victims of cancel culture who are Muslims and Arabs, who are people of color, who, you know, professors, Palestinian professors who were targeted by people like Barry Weiss simply because they're Palestinian or they support Palestinian self-determination. Um, you know, people who may have given to a charity or a charity organization that did relief work in you know, in Lebanon that may have had to deal with, you know, Hezbollah or did work in the Palestinian territories and, you know, in Palestine and did work with Hamas, maybe, maybe not, but people's lives have been ruined, not just the last 20 years, but for decades, simply because of being part of a community of Muslims. So that's like the real cancel culture. So I just find that part of the culture, like, I don't know if cursing is permitted, but it's so fucking dumb, right? It's just so fucking dumb. And it just makes me angry. And so to hear it parroted out again and again, it's like, you know, it, it is and the, the problem I think was eye opening too for us is like, we realized, okay, so it was easy when Trump was president because it's like, there's, he's the bad guy, right? Muslim ban. But we all knew that Trump is a bad dude, uh, but he's also, those policies have been enabled by that kind of like liberal establishment, uh, including Muslim organizations, including Muslim folks who sold out their communities, right? Uh, and bought into this narrative of Islamic extremism, uh, turned a blind eye to, far right stuff and et cetera. So I think that that all crystallized here where it's like, it's actually Trump, at least you know where you stand with him. I'm gonna steer clear of them, but it's like kind of center left liberals who parrot the same stuff, but launder their propaganda through the guise of humanitarianism, you know, um, so. Whoa, yeah, laundering their propaganda through the guise of humanitarianism. I'm gonna be thinking about that because that feels like really, yeah, really on point. Um, yeah, I have a question that kind of takes us back into the realm of representation, but thinking specifically about Muslim communities because um, I wanted to ask about the, represent the relationship between representation and visibility given you know, our unique relationship to visibility in the US, since we are hyper surveilled, hyper tracked, watched by the government in kind of a state sanctioned way. And visibility being different from representation, being, can, being different from all kinds of other things. But I guess to sum up my question, as filmmakers and image makers, I wonder if you think about that or if how you balance the urgency in needing to be the ones to tell our own stories with the legacy of our communities being surveilled and scrutinized, as you've all pointed out, um, not just for the last two plus decades, but certainly in like a exponential way in the last two decades. 
Yeah, such a big uh, question. I mean, yeah. we're both vis visible. <laughs> we're both visible and invisible at the same time. And you know, it's it's not like in popular culture we're completely um, invisible or absent from the frame. You know, we're often portrayed through shows like you know shows and films like American Sniper or um, you know Zero Dark Thirty, Twenty Four, um, Homeland. Um, mm -hmm. And that type of visibility creates a framework. Uh, it's very dehumanizing. Um, and I think it's one of the things that it's one of the elements of cultural hege hegemony against who Muslims are, which makes it easier to invade and occupy, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the Arab and Muslim countries in the last, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and it pacifies the public in accepting government actions. A lot of what you know, Sammy was alluding to earlier as well. So we do have this type of visibility, um, but it's it's a type of visibility that's just so dehumanizing. And so I think w where we start to balance it out or try to actually have a voice in that is through the work that we're creating, um, which is um, intended to be authentic and represent the community in a more nuanced way um, to try to counterbalance the narrative that's uh, already existing um, in the world, which is very, very difficult to battle. It's very difficult to um, unpack that. And very well-meaning uh, people in America, the West, and all over the world uh, are impacted and influenced by popular culture. So, you know, we, we're just a small group of filmmakers. And then if you include the people working in narrative and television, okay, maybe our community gets a little bit bigger, but we're just a very small group of people. And it's really challenging to make a dent in that public perception. And one of the things that we see is through public research from like the Pew Center, that public impression of Muslims is very, very, very low. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so many true popular representations of Muslims in, in the media. I mean, I'm not saying anything, you know, profound, but that connection is very real. And so it puts a great responsibility on us to try to change that narrative because there's people's lives are at stake. Um, our public safety, our public health, our mental health is at stake. I, I, I don't know that we'll survive um, unless you know, filmmakers are out there and, you know, and by extension, I would include writers and journalists and, um, you know, um, uh, professors, uh, you know, people who shape culture and influence culture. Um, Muslims have to have a foothold within that landscape. Uh, otherwise, everybody else is going to tell our story. So it's really challenging to balance that visibility and invisibility um, and then certainly the hyper visibility within the state security apparatus, uh, the NSA, um, the CIA, the FBI, and how hyper visible Muslims are within those institutions. You know, it's just it's such an uphill battle. And when it comes to that, you know, it's like, okay, do we do we become part of those institutions to try to correct them, um, uh, or do we just or do we criticize and protest um, those institutions from the outside? I don't know what the answer is, you know, but I, I think those are all kind of different arenas in which we're trying to um, establish ourselves in, you know, whether it's government or pop culture, um, you know, or storytelling. Uh, we just we have to be in the we have to be in the room. Um, exactly, Rosie. <laughs> this is Jude. Um, I. I think that we've lost a lot of respect for art um, in our communities in the region. Um, and I think a lot of it goes back to the fact that we were colonized by land um, and now it's made us like colonized um, by mind. And I think it really goes back to like, if your house is burning down, like the last thing that you're gonna pick up is the painting that's on the wall, you know? And so like that kind of took the back burner. And so for all of us to be coming up now and trying to, rebuild that respect and honor um, that can only, I think, come from thought. Um, and yeah, there's a quote that I love that says, um, 
everything goes, but cultural is eternal. And it just really makes you think that like, yeah, like the US's biggest export is culture. And um, this is our role, like this is why we're here. And, and the worst thing that can come, um, like the opposite of visibility is invisibility. And when that would happen, we, we're gonna forget who we are. And so like, I feel like I came into film just to remind us of the greatness that we come from. Um, yeah. It's our duty. I think like, another I one of the than yeah. anything. Sorry, Rosie. <laughs> like, I can go off on this, yeah, but like, no, bring up my mom said, "Don't be a doctor. We have enough." Like, you know, you we have to be in media. Like, we've completely left this field, um, and because we've left it, people, you know, there's holes, there's cracks, and people can just go in it and fill it. Because that's what's happened. Um, sorry, Rosie. <laughs> no, you you bring up a really good point, which is like, you know, we've been talking in this discussion about so many of the challenges outside of the Muslim community, with the film industry, the documentary community. But there's actually some very unique challenges within the Muslim community as well of being a filmmaker and trying to balance that visibility and visibility, you know, sort of um, spectrum. Um, and uh, there's just not a lot of support um, for Muslim filmmakers. And I, I was invited to a mosque to give a give a like an artist talk um, in, you know, last fall. and you know, somebody asked me this question. They were like, oh, you know, we didn't know about your work. It's it's really great what you're doing and showing our community and so on and so forth. How, how do non-Muslims react to your work? And I was like, to be honest, actually, it's primarily non-Muslim non -Muslim audiences that are supporting the work and funders and organizations and even individuals. Um, my last feature, which is about democracy in America's first Muslim majority city, the the major donor was a secular atheist Hindu physician. Uh, he gave a very generous donation to the project. Um, and there are people in the Muslim community that um, have immense resources that could support um, these really, really critical projects, but they don't see the value in it. And our stories will be written and told by other people, and then we're not going to like the results when you know we're not going to like the results of what we see but we have an opportunity right now you know with people like myself jude sammy and and other filmmakers that are out there in this small small group of muslim filmmakers um there's a chance to support you know this community but i think you know there's just not a lot of value in the muslim community and specifically i'm talking about the muslim communities in the united states of immigrant backgrounds um, primarily South Asian or Middle East. Um, the, I think it's just really difficult and challenging within those communities to um, gain support and raise awareness for the type of work that we're doing. Um, it feels, uh, I think, to the community largely irrelevant or um, not as big of a platform, um, you know, for instance, as opposed to politics. So Muslims very generously donate to Democratic politicians and sometimes Republican politicians too. Um, but uh, to, you know, advocate for a film, it's really challenging. Not to go on a tangent, but that funder that I spoke about earlier was from the region. So just to put things into perspective. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you guys for your responses. We have a couple minutes left. I didn't know if Sammy, if you wanted to jump in, but no worries. Um, oh, Abby says in the chat, sometimes we are our own gatekeepers. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I would just, I would just like chime in and say, um, again, the what Muslims face, both in terms of surveillance, in terms of like, you're making a project about your family in Lebanon, right? You're making a family that's set here, U.S. Lebanon. Just think of the hoops that Jude has to hop through in terms of like protecting her her data, you know, having to deal with customs and border protection in terms of dealing with the authorities in Lebanon, right? So it's like you don't, it's, you, it's not just dealing with surveillance from the U.S. government judgment from, you know, neoliberal, neoconservatives, far right, the U.S. It's judgment from those governments, from, you know, home countries, your parents' countries, and it's judgment from the community itself, right? And who, because of 
in often cases, U.S. Cold War policy, the most hardline forces, the most reactionary forces have been supported. And, you know, artistic leftist movements were destroyed, you know, after World War II. So it's really dangerous <laughs> to be, you know, a Muslim Arab Manasa filmmaker. It really is dangerous. And that is a calculation we take, you know, when we're setting out on certain projects. Like I have definitely decided not to tell certain projects because I've got kids now. I, I have a wife, I have kids, I have friends. I have like, I don't know if I can tell that story in a safe way. Like I don't you know, I can't go on my honeymoon without being pulled aside by Customs and Border Protection, you know? So again, it's just like the whole debate about who actually faces censorship, who actually faces cancel culture is totally misguided. Um, and, you know, I think that I'm, you know, appreciative of you, Layla, you know, holding space for us, for Abby, for organizing it, because it gives us an opportunity to sort of reframe the conversation, um, to articulate just the obstacles that we actually are up against um, continually. Yeah, thanks for thanks for saying that and pointing that out. I feel like that's a really lovely place to end, but I also want to make sure everyone had a chance to um, say what's on their mind or any final thoughts or questions for each other or anything at all. Yeah. I say, Sammy, you're amazing. <laughs> like, just think about what you just, it's sometimes you say things that we, we don't even notice because we're just mm -hmm. so in it. We're just so used to it. You know, we're used to going, like you said, you know, going through all these obstacles to make these films made because it just comes with being from the region. And it's like, you don't even notice it at times. Yeah, absolutely agree. You've all brought up so many thoughts and things that I'm going to be thinking about, like, for years to come um, and processing. Sammy, do you have something else to add? Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say, I am in awe of like Judy and Rezzy who are, I'm, you know, I was amongst the older members of the group, but you know, the next generation, I don't know if we're different generations, but it feels Sammy like it, the, <laughs> the, the energy and the honesty and the principles that, you know, uh, I've seen in, in Judy and Rezzy, you know, the last, about a year now has been really inspiring and uh, it's been fun just like texting about other projects and, uh, you know, again, supporting this ecosystem. You know, it's been a really dark whatever, not just 20 years, 100 years, a few centuries. So if you think about like building kind of positive picture of Muslim futures, to borrow that word from my friend Kareem, it's like, how do we imagine a world free of these oppressive structures and the constant bullshit. So that's exciting. That's thrilling. And I'm, you know, honored to, to be in company with you all. I love. Yeah, same. Uh, yeah. It's I've admired, I've admired so many of, of you guys from afar, you know, over the years. And, uh, it's been really incredible to be part of this community and, uh, and 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 yeah, I, I think you know we have a bright future ahead of us, and I'm very hopeful. And um, I think a lot of us have been working in our own little hubs and, and our own communities. And now there's a lot of uh, communication and and conversations about collaboration and working on projects together, and obviously sharing space like through panels like this. And um, you know, I'm very appreciative of of the IDA for um, hosting us and giving us this platform. I think. Um, this is something that uh, was a long time coming. Um, and if I could just, you know, also lift up coincidentally just around this time that um, Noshin Dadavoy's uh, documentary, An Act of Worship, premiered at Tribeca um, a couple of months ago, which um, documents and, and showcases the last 30 years of Muslim life in America. It's a very, very powerful documentary. I highly recommend it um, for anybody that wants to try to understand what it has been like for Muslims in the last 30 years. It's just a profound artifact that um, uplifts our voices and shows what life has been like um, through our own perspective and literally through our own voices because um, it's a heavily archival um, uh, documentary and um, we're going to be showing it in Detroit uh, very soon and they're on their impact campaign tour right now. So. 
I believe there's screenings in LA and Orange County, New York and Detroit in the near future. And um, if you follow Noshin, then um, you'll learn about the other screenings that are, that'll be taking place across the country. Yeah, Abby writes in the chat that Noshin is one of the hosts of the visual arrangement session at Getting Real. So we should all tune into that and support Noshin. I love that you all are uplifting other Muslim makers right now and thinking about the ecosystems that we can build that are our own, that are not necessarily about assimilation or joining a pre-existing ecosystem, but thinking about what what would serve us? What would be a world in which we don't have to always be proving our humanity um, through media? So thank you guys so much. You have been dropping wisdom, gems, truths, and I'm just like also really deeply honored to be in the presence of you three. Um, thank you to Abby and the whole IDA team. Thank you to Bob and Andrea for um, interpreting us uh, today. And I'm really excited for getting real. Thank you, Layla. Thank you so much. Thank you for having so us. So inspiring. Thanks, Layla. <laughs>